forward. I'm, we're, I'm very glad that we're doing this. We're establishing a, a baseline, get people going, and we'll have some uh, video to share. Hopefully, hopefully the, the video will work again this time and I remember how to punch it through. Excellent. Did you ever did you ever get the the video from the first one, James? No, the first one seems to be lost. OK, but a lot of time. Yeah, it's that's it seems fine to me. So OK, uh, now we'll we'll just have to try and gain some fresh audience. I'm curious about that. I'll talk to our exec see, and see about promoting even more. So, and uh, you know, by the last one, we'll have a hundred people in here. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. I would think with the big uh, exchange issue and everything else that's going on right now, that people would check in and see what's happening. So, um, yeah, one one would hope, or maybe you've scared them off because I mean, you know, obviously you're an NT group, you're using exchange, you know, you may be a danger to everyone. <laughs> it's our fault. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> uh, laugh, but We're maybe. actually all just out patching right now. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There, there's the truth. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, I have I have noticed an uptick in spam, but I thought it started a little bit before the hafnium attack. So uh, uh, then again, I'm not sure exactly when when that started. So uh, anywho, I suppose uh, security lessons from COVID-19 part three, uh, getting on to uh, uh, physical and business continuity and a few other things uh, this time around. Next time, which will be April the 6th, um, we're, we're moving off the uh, COVID finally, um, and we'll be doing homomorphic encryption. So there's the, uh, uh, the first one, of course, is the link uh, for the actual meeting itself on April the 6th and uh, details on, on the series and, and everything and, and what's necessary for your uh, uh, promotional uh, materials and, and uh, efforts uh, is, is there the, the second one. So uh, hopefully that will uh, go out to a few people and, and we'll see what happens on April the 6th, three days before my birthday. Oh well. Well, Anyways, happy pre-birthday. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so again, uh, uh, last year, uh, it's it's been a year. Happy COVID pandemic anniversary as of uh, uh, a few days ago. I guess it was Thursday. Uh, we had that. And and again, uh, the fact that we haven't been too terribly badly off here in, in uh, British Columbia in, in comparison to other people and, and what they uh, have said. And and once again, uh, the the Dr. Bonnie show, I, uh, it's it's an excellent, uh, you know, if you want to know anything about effective communications of very complicated uh complex situations and um uh, that's that's what to go to uh it's uh she has been absolutely amazing all year and uh, we are extremely fortunate to have her um and starting off with our our good old uh, cia confidentiality integrity and and availability of course uh this is being recorded uh, and hopefully we'll we'll post it up on YouTube. Uh, and in in other parts of of confidentiality, um, interesting stuff about contact tracing. Um, the the battle between the the uh, need for secu uh, sorry uh, well security of person in in terms of uh, public health and and the need to uh, get uh detailed information from people and then the uh you know the lack of privacy that that involves when when people have to turn that information over and and different ways of contact tracing and uh the various contact tracing apps i'm not even sure if 
the uh, uh, the app, the phone app, is working yet in British Columbia. Um, certainly in terms of its effectiveness back east, it's pretty much a dud. Um, I can't remember exactly uh, what the numbers were in Ontario, but they haven't been a resounding success in terms of tracing um, uh, people, uh, warning people that they might have been uh, infected. Um, it, it just has not been terribly effective. So, uh, you know, technology has not been our friend in, in this one, it, at least in terms of the contact tracing. It's still, you know, the good old phone contact tracing and, and that sort of thing. Um, we're seeing some really interesting stuff. As I, I wrote in the book, um, the vaccine administration, everybody's saying, you know, oh, you know, the vaccines have been approved, you know, good, and we're, you know, we're finished. Well, no, we're not finished. There's all kinds of administration that was done. Um, and uh, 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 Gloria was reading something in the paper today uh, about um, uh, people uh, helping out, assisting in um, the vaccine administration. Uh, and as as I said to her uh, a few days ago, you know, it, it's uh, not just the people trained to put uh, shots in arms. There's an awful lot of administration that goes into that. You have to record the uh, the name, the the care card number, you know, some confirmation uh, of identity. Um, you have to, uh, of course, record the the date and time of uh, administration of the shots. You have to uh, record which vaccine they got, which lot and batch they got. Um, you have to record uh, the people who were involved in, in administering the shot, in, in uh, uh, reconstituting the stuff because uh, these things don't come just, you know, ready-made. Uh, and ready to go. So there's, you know, there's all kinds of administration that has to go on in there. And it's, you know, it's no wonder that the vaccine administration is just taking time to do this quite apart from from the availability of supply. Uh, so, you know, tons and tons. Uh, plus, of course, you have to do all of this in the middle of a pandemic and have uh, facilities available uh, where people are not going to be uh, forced to congregate together, uh, aren't going to be too close together, where the staff are not going to be forced into too close contact with, with the patients that they're dealing with, all kinds of things. Then we got the vaccine passports, and that's just a huge privacy can of worms. Um, all the administration that goes into administering the vaccine has to be recorded. Now, do we record these on the vaccine passports? If not, why not? Because there's all kinds of information there. You know, if there's a certain batch number, lot number that doesn't work, um, I, I know there's already been uh, uh, various reports out of the United States. Um, there was uh, one guy who let the vaccine expire. He um, uh, uh, left it out of the fridge, whatever, you know, so so the stuff thawed basically uh, became probably useless and then still administered it to patients. Um, there uh, have been instances where th this was uh, just pure error um, that they they injected people with nothing. Uh, all kinds of people were supposedly vaccinated. Uh, but there was no vaccine available. I, I assume that, you know, it was just, you know, saline uh, or whatever that, that they weren't uh, injected with. Um, so, you know, all the all the information that you need to have about the the administration of the vaccine has to be recorded in in the passport. And then, you know, what are you going to be using this for? Are you going to be using it for travel? That means all kinds of international governments are going to have to agree with the the format of this data stored on a uh, passport of some type, which is probably going to be digital information rather than printed information. Um, 
So you're going to have, uh, you know, cards and card readers and and uh, all kinds of stuff in, in along that line uh, in in regard to um, is this uh, is this stuff going to uh, work work out OK? Um, what kind of privileges do you give people? You know, is this sort of admission to the con uh, country? Is this boarding of an aircraft? Is this uh, simply being used for you get to go to a restaurant or a gym or or whatever? So uh, all kinds of questions about that. How you know how much information is being stored? Where is the information being stored? Is it on the card? Is it in a central location? Um, who's who's authenticating this? Who's protecting this? How do you protect this information? So tons and tons and tons of questions, uh, particularly in regard to confidentiality, although certainly in terms of uh, integrity, uh, in, in regard to whether or not you're going to use vaccine passports. Is there any point in in doing any of that? Is is this uh, going to be of any use? And, and are we going to come to any agreements before, uh, you know, uh, COVID becomes a, a non-issue. Um, all kinds of questions there. Um, integrity, of course, uh, the mis and disinformation and all the disinformation that we've seen there. Um, one of the things that uh, was really interesting is that there has been a significant drop in the use of news media sources, news sites on, on the web during the pandemic and a very significant increase in the use of social media as news, as news sources. As, you know, people are getting their news from social media. <laughs> That's kind of dangerous, uh, as, as um, somebody said. Uh, you know, half the people in the United States have never read a newspaper, half of them have never voted for the president. Um, Hopefully it's the same half, uh, but unfortunately, probably not. Um, one of the the interesting things um, in regard to QAnon, one of the major sources of disinformation, is the uh, supposed Q sources breadcrumbs. These these little clues that are left scattered about the internet, and this is really interesting in terms of social engineering because it. Because of the breadcrumbs, you know, people think that they are going out and finding things. They think they are doing research, and that makes people more resistant to correction. They they believe this garbage, these lies, these these falsities, and this disinformation. Um, and when you try and explain to them, no, that's not true, um, they don't believe you because they found it out for themselves. Uh, and it's you know. I wish we could turn it around ourselves. You know, maybe there is some way we could use discovery learning in uh, technology or security to to kind of force people to or or get people interested in learning something about security. But um, at the moment, it's just being used uh, very effectively, depressingly effectively uh, to uh, to spread uh, disinformation and and uh, keep people from. Uh, being corrected in, in that regard. Uh, availability again, good old toilet paper and, and that sort of thing, but the supply chains and, and we'll talk more about that when we get into the, the business continuity part here. Um, is has been really interesting in, in regard to the pandemic. What has uh, uh, been available? How has it been available? What has not been available? What you know, what has the pandemic done? Um, that has created problems for us in dealing with the pandemic itself. Um, but the supply chains also uh, have pointed out the uh, the good old uh, reflections on trusting trust article from uh, Ken Thompson, uh, where uh, he pointed out that that you could. Uh, you know, at some point in the supply chain, he was talking about very early on in the supply chain, uh, create a problem that that then is ongoing. And of course, that was used in in the solar winds attack. 
that uh, all the people in the world who were uh, using solar winds, these guys managed to, to get in and um, insert a, uh, you know, a, a piece of malware uh, that was, you know, labeled, uh, you know, certified, digitally signed as coming from solar winds. And, and then it, you know, it was sent out like an update. Uh, people downloaded it, installed it, and of course, became part of that attack, became uh, victims of that solar winds attack. So, you know, the, uh, the supply chains issue, I suppose it, in, in that regard to supply chains, that maybe is, is more into the integrity part, but uh, uh, supply chains can get you a couple of different ways. So, um, a few of the uh, things that we've already talked about, security management, risk management. Um, cost benefit analysis, of course, is, is a major part of, of risk management, and it's been uh, definitely something that we've been looking at in regard to the pandemic. What's the cost of isolation versus reopening the economy? You know, people say we've got to reopen the economy. Well, you know, uh, now, in, in terms of security, one, one of the things that we keep on having to, to thump on newcomers to the field is that security serves business, not the other way around. You know, we, we are there to help out the business. And, uh, you know, so you would think, you know, we're on the side of reopening the economy. But uh, there is also the point that life sa safety is the number one priority. And so, uh, you know, we're we're pretty solidly on the isolation side, certainly in terms of at least the the five heroic acts and, and that sort of thing. So um, it's a it's a very complex, very complicated calculus uh, in terms of the risk management and the cost benefit analysis. Uh, and it has, you know, the, the COVID, the pandemic has definitely pointed out the complexity of making these decisions and and uh, probably uh, opening it out at, for discussion more clearly because we have gotten too used to oversimplifying many of the risk management uh, assessments and analyses uh, that we have done up until now so a salutary fashion. Uh, again, security management, emergency management is for emergencies, and that particularly is going to be true looking at business continuity planning. So, and oh, and yes, I, again, uh, search and rescue North Shore on the Knowledge Network. I, I really, um, it's a it's a cool thing, uh, and and hopefully you you go and have a look at that. It's um, it's really nice. So. Um, layered defense and, and defense in depth. Um, I'm I'm seeing more of this uh, uh, these days that that people are thinking, okay, well, I'm wearing a mask, so social distancing, physical distancing, isn't important. Or you know, I've I've just sanitized my hands, so um, uh, you know I don't need to worry about the distancing. Uh, you know that that is that's the fallacy that defense in depth and layered defense is trying to address here. Staying at home is not perfect. Distancing is not perfect. Hand washing isn't perfect. Masks aren't perfect. Vaccines aren't perfect. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not going to be, you know, when now we're getting the vaccines and, and people are, are thinking, you know, oh, as soon as I get my jab, I can go out and have a party. Well, you know, you know, maybe everybody else at the party hasn't had the vaccine. Uh, plus, of course, the fact that it's going to take a month after you get your first shot before it really takes effect. And even at that, it's not 100%. Um, you need to keep the defenses in place, the, the different defenses, because of the fact that the uh, none of them are perfect. 
all of them together are going to decrease your risk. Even all of them together aren't you know, 100%. Uh, but certainly, you want to reduce your risk as, as much as possible. I've been uh, corresponding today with a friend uh, from 30 years ago who's a, a long hauler, and uh, uh, he's been talking about his experiences. And uh, I mean, that is that is not something you want to go through. He was he was, you know, quite, quite ill for three weeks, um, coughing so much. You you he was really in danger of suffocating. Um, and uh, and then, you know, after the symptoms started to recede, um, it's been two and a half months now and he's still going through uh, some of the long haul systems symptoms. Um, and it's it's interesting. Uh, I hadn't heard uh, uh, people really push the fact that it's it's sort of uh, cyclical. It's there's a periodicity to it that um, you'll uh, you know get get a bit better, and then it gets a little bit worse, and then you get a bit better, and you get and each each time the the worse isn't quite as bad, and the the better is a little better. But um, interesting that it's it's up and down, and of course. You know, that is, uh, we've seen that in, in lots of uh, medical situations and in, in lots of things. I know that uh, uh, when I had my gallbladder out, I, you know, I went through a similar type of thing that, you know, there, there'd be days that I'm thinking, oh, oh I'm, I'm getting better. I'm finally over this, you know, and then back into it more. And, uh, you know, so that's, that's an interesting thing. One other thing he got, um, uh, vaccinated subsequent to uh, uh, to uh, getting uh, COVID um, uh, sometime, I think at least six or seven weeks after he had uh, uh, had COVID. So he was, you know, sort of recovered, but still in that sort of long haul period. And he said the uh, getting the first shot put him like right back in the beginning. It was it was like another week of the the really vicious symptoms that he had had. Uh, to begin with, so uh, you know this is uh, this is not something that you want to go through. So you know all the layers of defense are things you should still be doing. So into physical security, um, physical distance, of course, is important here. Uh, why am I showing you this big uh, 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 pavement grinder here? Well, it's because it's got this. Uh, uh, sign on it that says maintain your social distance and, and two meters between the, the two people on it. And I, you know, I just as I was walking past this thing, I thought this is, um, you know, do I really have to be warned to, to stay two meters away from an asphalt grinder? You know, if it was in operation, I would definitely stay, be staying uh, quite far away from it. But anyway, little uh, see. Also, physical security. This mask won't protect you from COVID-19, but it'll sure help with the social distancing. So people unclear on the concept in terms of what masks are effective and what masks are not. And uh, other aspects when you're when you're going out and during the virus crisis, if you must go out, know that you might get coughed on or sneezed on. And since disinfecting fabric is much more difficult than cleaning flat surfaces, you should really wear older clothing that can be discarded if necessary. If you have old torn clothing that will not be missed, this is probably best. Since face masks are in short supply, a scarf worn over the mouth, nose, and lower part of the face may offer some protection. If you are infected and must go out for some reason, take a staff to aid you in walking should you be go overcome with respiratory distress and need something to lean on. Best to have bells hanging from the top to summon aid if needed. As you go, it is best to give some verbal warning to others not to come into close contact since you may encounter some who may not be professional in English. Probably a good idea to constantly call out something simple such as unclean, unclean. This is not meant to make fun of anyone who actually does have Hansen's disease, but uh, it just struck me. Anyways, cars and insurance. Um, yes, I, I remember uh, uh, back uh, almost almost as soon as the uh, 
uh, pandemic started and, and people started staying home, weren't driving as much and that sort of thing. And the whines and the howls because the insurance companies weren't, uh, and particularly ICBC, uh, weren't going to be giving uh, insurance uh, premiums back. And uh, boy, I've seen some of the driving that you guys have, have been doing since uh, businesses have been starting up again. And I know why the insurance companies are not giving your insurance premiums back. Uh, there's been some really lousy driving out there. Anyway, um, also another, another thing that I saw around the mall, um, no smoking rules indoors, rules about how far you have to be from a door. It's hard for the nicotine addicts to find a place to, to smoke at the mall. But one day I was, I was walking by the natural gas meters and realized that that was the place that all of them seem to be choosing. And I just, I really wondered about the choice there. You know, if you really need to have a cigarette, do you want to be beside a whole bunch of, of pipes and meters for the, you know, the natural gas coming into the building? Uh, that just did not seem to make an awful lot of sense. To me. You, you are talking about tobacco users. I am talking about tobacco Who've known users. for yes. decades that it's been dangerous. Yes. So that's probably just par for the course. They hang around explosive things. <laughs> it doesn't matter to them because they're going to die soon anyway. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> they take half the city out with them. They don't care. <laughs> okay, there's that. Um, I've seen a lot of these things about the the UV lamps um, that, you know, that people would say that they, uh, you know, sanitize this. I, I uh, one of the stores in, in my area um, has a buggy sanitizing station and you can put the buggy into this thing. Uh, for 15 seconds and it's, you know, supposedly sanitizing the buggy with UV light. Well, I mean, you can see into it. It, it doesn't have any covering over the, the area where you slide the buggy in. You can actually see the UV light on when, when it's working. Most of the time it's not working. Uh, although I saw somebody, uh, a, a tech, uh, working on it the other day, so maybe it's it's going to be starting up again. But um, people have UV lamps in ventilation systems. They have uh, handheld UV lamps that you can, you know, pass over surfaces. Uh, you know, it, all kinds of people have been pushing this UV, UV, UV. Well, yes, UV does kill the virus, and it does it in reasonably short order i think you know on on uh, ordinary surfaces it's it's maybe you know possibly 72 hours the virus is still viable um but you know four hours if it's in direct sunlight and of course you know direct sunlight does have ultraviolet and therefore you know people think well you know uv light is in sunlight so it's not dangerous well i know it's dangerous when it's at the levels you need to use to kill bacteria and, and particularly you know when you're talking 15 seconds you'd have to have a real plastic it would have to be really high intensity light and when i was uh working at the hospital um there was a device that that uh specialists used to use for deep brighting wounds that that used ultraviolet light now i never used it because you had to be a specialist to use it because um within seconds really if if you used it in the wrong way on the wrong setting um you could uh and and i know of one case where, where somebody did actually you know take the the skin off their arm uh by you know carelessly uh using this this machine and got that case it was a, actually another tech um, who came in they they told him that the system wasn't working um, he turned it on, rubbed it up and down his his arm, 
said, well, I don't know what's wrong with it. What had been wrong with it actually was the cooling jacket, not the UV light. The UV light was operating and they brought him in that night with uh, the skin basically gone from his his arm where he had uh, rubbed it on himself. So uh, I could have told you that these things are dangerous and, and uh, doctors are starting to warn now against, uh, you know, people using these these UV lamps. Um, if it can kill the virus, it can do some danger to you. So there, there are other things. Oh, and another, you know, walking around the mall. Yeah, it's always walking around the mall. Um, I'm, I'm in the mall, checking out where everybody is and swinging wide around corners so I don't, you know, run into somebody as I go around a corner. And it suddenly hits me that those movies where the attacker suddenly jumps out from an alcove or behind a door or, you know, that sort of thing, it's starting to seem really silly. You know, why would you be that close to someplace somebody could jump out at you? Uh, and, uh, you know, it, <laughs> already, I mean, it's only been a year, but already I'm, I'm looking at, at old movies and TV shows and the gang gets together and, and, you know, my immediate reaction is you're too close. You're too close together. Don't, you know, it's dangerous. On the other hand, gangster movies where there's a, a meet in a huge warehouse and everyone is completely paranoid and carrying guns and, and that sort of and staying away from each other. You know, it's sort of like, yeah, that's that's what you should be doing. You know that. So uh, interesting the way that uh, uh, some of this is going to make us uh, change the way we think about uh, some of our activities. Maybe I don't know. Uh, interesting to to see that, but uh, anyway. So. Uh, oh, well, I don't know. Is it is it break time? Do we need a break? Um, anyways, the German government is advising people in the lockdown to stock up on sausage and cheese. It may be a worst case scenario. Oh, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> good one, good one. That, that's, a, that's a good dad's joke, Rob. <laughs> Oh, yes. Grandpa jokes more grandpa jokes. <laughs> yeah, what's worse than a dad joke? A grandpa joke. <laughs> anyway, anyway, any, any questions so far? Um, oh, you know, um, a misspelling. You, you spelled meters in the wrong context with gas meters. Yeah. Okay. That's just a minor thing. Just next time. Yep. Um, questions. If I if I put that into the second edition of the, if there is a second edition of the book, <laughs> I still haven't got my author copies. What? So I, haven't, I haven't seen it. Oh, I I know it's out there. Some some guy got it uh, uh, the day it came out, which was the the day after the last meeting, the uh, March the third. It came out and uh, uh, very. Uh, kindly wrote a review of my of my book um but so i know it's out there but no, i haven't seen it yet oh um so we got what four people on this um video thing today tonight or am i not counting yeah. up everybody no that's that seems to be the case okay there's a couple uh, over on zoom too as well okay ah, you've got the zoom thing working uh, it seems to be working. Everybody's happy, so hopefully that uh, they're there. There's a couple of visitors, but it's not really integrated, so we'll just have to make sure we get a unified uh, 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 invite and make sure we distribute uh, your invites, Rob. So that seems to be what's working. Yeah, and uh, it's, um, well, as I say, it's, it's been uh, uh, interesting uh, doing this on Teams, and, and I'm glad that uh, yeah. uh, whatever uh, bug there is on Teams, if there is one, didn't didn't affect us tonight. Any any questions from your Zoom people? Well, Zoom is working fine for me. 
Yeah, it's uh, Maholter says it's working fine for him. Any questions, Maholter? No, I think I can I can listen hear everything. Perfect. It's been good so far. Yeah, yeah. I've just got shared it shared it through my living room in audio, so it's going good. Good. So, it's uh, it's working, and uh, I really appreciate the conversation, Rob. It's nice to hear um, some sane advice out there. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, hopefully. Okay. Oh, one uh, last okay. thing, one personal thing. Uh, Rob, uh, Angela says hi to you and Gloria. I will pass it along to Gloria when, when this is over, yes. Okay. Thank you, and hello to Angela. That's it for me. And hello to Angela from the rest of us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. And hello huh? to Mohinder too. Yes. Okay, we'll uh, uh, carry on then, I guess, uh, and see how we get. Okay, business continuity planning. Um, use anything you can to as as a reason to get senior management interested in doing some business continuity planning, and. Uh, as uh, this guy from Dow Chemical said, the best way to get management excited about a disaster plan is to burn down the building across the street. Well, an awful lot of buildings have been burning down across an awful lot of streets uh, for the past year. Um, there's There's been all kinds of, of companies uh, who have gone belly up, and it's not just the little mom and pop operations. I know that um, you know, uh, theater, entertainment, um, bars and restaurants and that sort of thing, they've been complaining that they've been really hit. The, the travel industry, uh, the cruise industry, you know, they've all been complaining about um, uh, that, you know, they've, they've been hit. Um, but, I mean, big retailers, uh, major retailers, um, have have gone bankrupt and this is at a time when a number of, of businesses um certainly anybody who's got an online presence it would seem um have not been just been able to survive but but have been thriving in the environment because a lot of people are staying home there are a lot of things that they're not paying for they're not putting gas in their cars they're not eating out as much um, there is more disposable income, and so people are doing a, a lot of buying, and yeah, particularly online shopping. And you know, it's it's really been kind of surprising to me uh, the number of uh, stores, major retailers, um, who either have gone belly up, or uh, I think Walmart has just uh, closed six stores across Canada uh, or is in the process of, of closing them down. Um, you know, and, and these are uh, not companies that you would think um, would uh, be facing a problem. Uh, you know, uh, they know that they, you know, they have resources, they're a good size, they're going to be able to get um, loans uh, from the banks and certainly interest rates are, are way down right now. So, you know, a uh, good time, even if you're not doing land office business for retrenchment, any kind of uh, development that you want to do, uh, this is a good time to do it. But no, um, you know, lots of people and, and surprising people um, obviously have not done their business continuity planning. And you know, so uh, this is this is the time to push business continuity planning. Um, you know, this this was something that nobody expected. Well, you know, that's what business continuity planning is. Expect the unexpected. Uh, interesting uh, things that ha that the pandemic has has really pushed. Um, 
capital risk and financial margin. Now, this is this is really interesting because, um, as I said in the security frameworks presentation, a lot of the risk analysis stuff uh, that we have in uh, the security landscape comes from the financial industry, comes from banking, um, you know, the Basel uh, regulations and, and guidelines. Um, that's directly from the banking industry and, and all kinds of other um, financial uh, companies, um, their tools, COSO, those sorts of things, you know, um, all kinds of tools that we get from uh, the financial industry. And as I said, also, we have to be careful about that because most of what they're talking about is capital risk rather than operational risk and operational risk to them tends to be the whole of risk management for us but they're always talking about uh capital risk how much margin have you got um and and of course what you need to to do with that primarily is are there going to be sudden market changes and certainly the pandemic was a huge market change you know a, a change in all kinds of markets right across the board um some people were not doing anything some people were doing things in all kinds of different ways um you know restaurants if they're still surviving are only surviving because of uh doing takeout um you know all kinds of issues in in regard to that so uh that is is definitely something that needs to be looked at in terms of business continuity planning can you weather the storm um and i i think i I'm, I'm gonna talk a, a little bit more about efficiency but one of the things that it's really pointed out is all the companies that have trimmed the margins that have have uh made sure that they are you know lean and and mean uh marketing business machines whatever um efficiency is inherently brittle it does not provide for resilience so if uh you know if you are pursuing efficiency at the cost of everything else uh, you may be at great risk when this kind of an event happens. And uh, it, you know, it doesn't really matter uh, what you are. Like I said, you know, there's been some surprising bankruptcies that have been going on. And, uh, you know, we, we need to look at, at that capital risk part. Um, succession planning is is another thing, and I, I suppose in, in a sense, um, it's just a special case of, of something that we really need uh, to look at, particularly in a pandemic, and that's personnel. What are you doing with your personnel? Uh, but certainly, you know, um, you know, the, the number of deaths, uh, I know it's over half a million in the United States. I, I haven't looked at the, the numbers in a while, but, um, you know, the uh, the deaths worldwide, um, uh, I, I know it's close to 1,500 in, in the province of BC alone. Um, you know, there's got to be some important people who have died. Uh, you know, we've, well, you know, lots of important people have died, unfortunately. Um, but uh, it's, it's not just, you know, does your CEO uh, drop dead? Does your... Uh, you know your your senior management. You know that's that succession planning. It's it's very important to plan for that. Um, and we have seen a number of instances over the past year where people haven't planned, and and somebody has gone missing, uh, gone under the bus, died of COVID, whatever, and uh, you know now the company's in trouble because they haven't done that. And you know sometimes it's a very uh, uh, important functions in regard to addressing the pandemic as well. Um, the, but, you know, pay attention to your people. Personnel are uh, not just as important as, as the technology, more important. It doesn't, you know, if you 
have all your machines, all your software, all your data protected and that sort of thing, but you've got no employees, you're not going to do very much business. And, uh, you know, there's lots of employees who haven't been able to get to work, wanted to go to work. You know, um, you have to make a provision for people to uh, to work from home. Um, in terms of business continuity plans themselves. Uh, if you identify one person who absolutely has to be in your emergency operations center, that's a single point of failure. If that person doesn't come in, or if it's a regional disaster where, you know, there's an earthquake, there's, you know, whatever, and, and you know, that person is going to want to be with their family. So, plan for you know what provisions do you need to make for your personnel either for for losing them or for supporting them while they are supporting you and that's that's always something that i uh teach people is is very much part of business continuity planning um and and again we we talked a little bit about supply chains we talked about the solar winds and and that sort of thing uh, and, uh, you know, in, in the toilet paper instance and that sort of thing, the hoarding um, that went on at the beginning. Uh, now, it's, it's not as much anymore, but certainly in, in those early months, um, you know, it was really interesting. I was basically going to the store and uh, figuring out the, you know, uh, hoarded product of the week or or whatever you know uh this week we're out of meat this week we're out of toilet paper this week we're out of uh, you know whatever it might be um i i remember one one week it was it was soup oddly all the campbell's chunky soups were still there but every other brand of soup was gone I have no idea. I, I really like the Campbell's Junkie Soups, but uh, anyway. Uh, so, you know, weird, weird patterns of hoarding, but hoarding itself is is a, uh, well, I, I suppose it's the inherent vice of capitalism, but uh, um, it it does not work in, in a pandemic particularly, but in any disaster really makes things worse for everybody. Uh, now, in terms of initiating a business continuity plan, um, if you've got a large corporation, a full scale business continuity plan probably takes about three years. And of course, by the time three years goes by, it's already out of date by the time you've finished. Um, and when you're starting from scratch, um, you're going to be making a lot of mistakes. And certainly we've seen this in, in the pandemic. You know, we uh, the health authorities have had to create vaccine distribution and administration plans from scratch. Um, you know, we nothing has been done on this on this scale in this time frame with this level of desperation. And uh, you know there there are mistakes that are going to be made. Unfortunately, in in this kind of case, the best is very definitely the enemy of the good. That uh, if people say, well, we, you know, we have to have an absolutely perfect plan. No, you're never going to have a perfect plan. You want a good plan because a a good plan, a plan that actually exists, is better than a perfect plan which never will exist. So uh, any job that is worth doing is worth doing badly. And, and of course, you know, uh, business continuity, all of these emergency management uh, tasks are definitely worth doing. Um, hopefully you don't do them too badly, but do not worry about perfection. You need to, uh, you know, do, do as, as well as you can. Um, and I, I know, you know, uh, again, Dr. Bonnie um, is uh, being tasked in, in all kinds of ways. Uh, uh, Vaughn Palmer <laughs> wrote yet another column today, I think, uh, where uh, he jumped on the fact that she had admitted that uh, she didn't 
uh, shut down businesses, you know, lock, lock down uh, society as quickly as she would have liked to because the evidence didn't support that. Well, you know, honest to goodness, I mean, she has done an, an amazing job. She has uh, kept us from uh, the kind of numbers that are seen in the United States, the kind of numbers that are seen in the rest of Canada. Uh, you know, the, the fact that um, people have died of COVID-19 in NBC is definitely not her fault. Uh, she has done a good job. She has not done a perfect job. I think she will admit that she has not done a perfect job. And I, I think that we should thank her for the imperfect but very good job that she has done. Oh, and leadership, yeah. Um, Really interesting. Uh, I, I mean, when the pandemic began, particularly, uh, you know, overall last year, uh, we had an excellent example of, of leadership. All you had to do to think of, of what, uh, you know, good leadership and in terms of emergency management, business continuity planning looked like was look at Donald Trump and not do what he did. Um, and, and, you know, that really sums it up. Just, just look at the guy and, you know, whatever he did, do something else. Um, but it's, it's interesting that one of the things that you really have to do in, uh, business continuity planning is be consistent. You have to have consistent messaging. Um, you can't be waffling back and forth. You you definitely have to make decisions, and certainly in the middle of a disaster, you are making decisions on the basis of very imperfect information. And as the information changes, your decisions may have to change, but you you still have to somehow maintain that consistency in if you are in in leadership. Um, that is a that is a very difficult thing to do. Um, it's very difficult even to explain. It sounds contradictory. You have to change your decisions when the information changes, but you still have to be consistent. Well, of course, what you have to be consistent with is, is the the principles, the approach, um, the uh, direction that you're giving to people, the the position of trying to ensure that uh, it is the best for the greatest number. Um, but uh, unfortunately, um, you can't be perfect. Nobody can be perfect. Nobody is going to be perfect. Emergency management definitely is not perfect. Um, and we we just have to live with that uh, and do the job regardless. Uh, interesting part of business continuity planning is the difference between recovery and restoration. There's there's business continuity planning and disaster recovery planning. Now, business continuity is trying to ensure that the business continues. Disaster recovery is once the business has been interrupted. How do you recover operations as, as quickly and effectively as possible? So uh, they aren't exactly the same, but there's, you know, most of the work that goes into most of the planning that goes into most of the research that goes into it. Um, it applies almost equally to to both sides, business continuity and uh, disaster recovery. But as uh, there has been a disaster, the business has been interrupted. Um, when you get back up and running as quickly as you can, that's the recovery part. When you go back to normal operation, when you, you know, go back to your original site, if you were burned out or flooded out or, or whatever, that's called restoration. And it's, there's an interesting difference between recovery and restoration. 
when you are in recovery mode, you recover the most important systems first. You recover the most important business operations first, because of course they're the most crucial. They're the most important. That is the heart of your business. You have to be doing that or you're not doing business. That's recovery. But restoration, when you're getting back to normal, you restore the most important last. What you restore, when you get into restoration mode, you restore the least important, least critical stuff first as a kind of a test of what you're doing. And so recovery, you've, you've stopped fast and, and you recover your operations as, as quickly as you can, and, you know, in a hurry. But restoration, restarting your business after, you know, the recovery has been going on, the, the restoration, take your time, do the least important first, test as you're going, make sure that everything is working before you put the next least important, before you get to the more crucial aspects of what you're doing. And uh, it's, it's a very interesting point in a game. We've seen it in the pandemic. Uh, you know, the lockdown, we just stop. But restarting the economy, okay, let's take this carefully. Let's let's do this easily. Let's, and, and even the, just this past week, um, the easing of restrictions on public gatherings to a certain extent and it's been you know not in bars not in restaurants that sort of thing you can have meetings of up to 10 people outside with a lot of distance you know still distance still outside and and of course everybody's jumping the gun everybody thinking you know all they hear is 10 oh we can go you know 10 people to a restaurant no you can't restaurants out aren't outside not even patios are really outside outside is in a park where you can be 20 feet away from each other you know that's okay so yes and i mentioned efficiency redundancy and resilience um i like i say you know i've i've actually been been looking at this for uh 40 years, I would say, um, looking at the issue of efficiency, and it's it's bothered me. I, it's always bothered me that people who who go after, you know, trimming the margins, making sure that you get absolutely everything out of it. And I've had a problem with it, and I really didn't know why until this year. And this year I looked at it. OK, efficiency makes you brittle. Efficiency makes you mark uh, fragile. There's less margin there, so if anything goes wrong, you are instantly in trouble. And again, as I say, uh, you know, it's interesting to look at the companies, big companies, that haven't been able to weather the storm. And you know, I'm I'm fairly sure when they start to do some of the analysis of the businesses that went down this year, it's going to be that that question of efficiency that you know you you know efficiency was your god and you you know you you shaved and scraped for pennies and and fractions of of percentages and margins and that sort of thing and when something went wrong you couldn't survive so efficiency is not a great thing plan ahead um, I, you know, that is business continuity planning. I am business continuity planning is planning. You, you plan ahead of time. You make up your BCP, uh, before you need it. You think of what goes, could go wrong before it actually happens. You can't do business continuity planning after a disaster. You have to do it ahead of time. It is planning. Um, and, uh, you know, we've seen this. 
um, the the elections um, in NBC. Uh, I mean, we we had an election. We we did okay, just barely. I mean, we barely got through, you know, by the election, and and then the surge really started to hit. Um, but uh, you know, I, I think that there was uh, probably some some planning and consideration there about you know whether or not it was possible versus Newfoundland and Newfoundland. Um, I don't know that they really thought about it. They you know they were perhaps lulled into a false sense of security because the numbers in Atlantic Canada had been so low for so long. And so they decided, OK, we can hold an election and they held an election and right in the middle of the election, uh, actually close to the end, um, all of a sudden they had a surge and, you know, were people going to, to be able to vote? Now, part of the planning ahead is not just, you know, in, in terms of the government. Um, when they called an election, I went and registered for mail-in ballots. So, you know, we, we wanted to vote. We wanted to make sure that we could vote. Um, I, I registered. We got the ballots. Um, I found out where the uh, local uh, district returning office was. Um, I actually, when we filled in the ballots, I actually took them over. I didn't put them in the mail. I, I took them over to the returning office and, and handed them in there. You know, do some planning yourself. Um, I have seen so many uh, issues when there's been a a problem, you know, yet another outbreak at a long term care home and uh, people would say, you know, well, if I'd known that that, uh, you know, mom was going to be in that much danger, I never would have, you know, put her in that home. Well, you know, you had the option. For quite a while now. Of taking her home to your house yourself. Uh, and, you know, it, it's just, you know, uh, it kind of bugs me. These are people saying this is this. It is a, a disaster, you know, and, and somebody should do something. Well, my my response generally tends to be poor planning on your part does not constitute an emergency on my part. You know, plan ahead. Think of of what can happen. Think of what might happen. Uh, that is business continuity planning. Do your planning, do your planning in advance. Think of what could go wrong. Think of uh, how bad it might be. Think about that and plan for it. So, uh, and uh, for uh, you know those of you who didn't uh, uh, stock up on enough toilet paper, here is raw toilet paper for sale, 20 bucks. Some assembly required. Now, when I did this, this whole thing, I mean, the first uh, presentation, um, as as I said, you know, I first of all, this this started out with me. Uh, explaining to my security colleagues about the pandemic using security uh, concepts and examples so that they would understand that and then realizing, hey, you know, this could be a good uh, uh, set of lessons uh, for a, a conference or or what have you, and and so I I made the first one, and it, it just it grew as the pandemic grew. Um, uh, it uh, at one point I was helping somebody else with their book, and then their publisher got interested in, in my concept, and so it became a book. I had to write a book. Anyways, I, I structured you know, when I when I decided to make a presentation when I wrote the book, I structured it on the domains of information security, the original 10 domains of, of the CISSP. And uh, of course, one of them is cryptography. And I thought there's nothing about, you know, the pandemic that has anything to do with cryptography. Well, no, I was wrong. Um, the contact tracing a uh, protocol that everybody is using is is based on this DP3T uh, 
type of protocol with some variations. Some some people are doing more or less, but basically just uh, random numbers. And uh, you can do that. You know, you, you just generate a random number, uh, broadcast it. It gets recorded by anybody who's who's nearby, and that provides for uh, a way to identify at least, you know, nearby contacts um, when you are uh, in in close proximity for a, a period of time and therefore identifies danger to you uh, without betraying any any personal information, really, any private information. Now, as I say, you know, there's there's variations on this. As soon as you start recording along with those random numbers, location data, timing data, and that sort of thing, that data can start to be mined for uh, personal information. And uh, I think, like uh, I said, next next presentation is on homomorphic encryption, but I think it's the one after that that's on differential um, privacy. And there's some interesting stuff in terms of how private information can be uh, when you start collecting and aggregating uh, that information and and some interesting uh, stuff there. But anyways, uh, there there is here a, a bit of a case for uh, uh, cryptography, even in the middle of a, a pandemic. So. Application security. Um, the yeah, we, we do different types of testing in application security and different types of testing gives us different information. Well, it's the same thing here with the pandemic. Uh, we do different types of testing. We've got the uh, PCR testing that actually identifies uh, sort of a, a, like a, a virus uh, signature, uh, the signature of a particular virus and therefore gives us, you know, yes, you have COVID. And um, we even now have tests, uh, same types of tests. We can't quite do it in the same way, but at least uh, there, there are ways to identify, yes, you have not just COVID, but a variant of a certain type. Uh, so different types of testing will give us different information. The uh the testing involved in um rapid testing very often is based not on the, the pcr test but on antibodies that gives you different types of information that gives you information about um you may have had the virus with or without symptoms or you may simply have been exposed uh at some point without developing um, either symptoms or uh, the disease itself. Or increasingly these days, it may indicate you've had the vaccine. So, uh, you know, again, um, those types of tests may give you different information. And of course, uh, as I pointed out before, the, uh, the accuracy of the tests are different. And those uh, rapid tests uh, may give you results very quickly, but they may not give you the correct results. And, and uh, we know that some of them are as high as as uh, thirty percent, um, you know, false, you know, errors. So uh, it's kind of like you know, where, how do you use that, and and what situations can you use that, and 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 still get useful information. And uh, uh, <laughs> because of malware, um, in in terms of the toilet paper and and everybody uh, uh, hoarding uh, toilet paper, um, a a paper mill here in British Columbia got hit with a virus, and so everyone who has stockpiled toilet paper should safely dispose of it because it may have been infected with a virus. And of course, having said that, I have to explain that. That is just a joke that 
no viruses do not spread that way. Uh, coronavirus does not jump to your computer. Um, computer viruses don't get onto your toilet paper. Uh, you know, it's a joke. It's a joke. OK, it's a joke. I will probably regret that somebody is going to take me seriously. So um, an interesting thing that I have been stressing for years. Um, security, a, a lot of people uh, for for a number of years have learned security based on the bastion model, which is, um, you know, we build walls around us, we strengthen any any loopholes, any vulnerabilities uh, that, you know, the bad guys are on the outside. There's a wall that protects us and we're on the inside. We're the good guys. And of course, coming from a computer virus research background, I knew that the Bastion model was wrong, but this uh, certainly the the pandemic with a real virus has demonstrated that the Bastion model is wrong. Um, we have seen over and over again that helping others helps you. I mean, one of the things that they are uh, starting to really talk about uh, on the news reports of the virus is, is mental health and how the virus is infecting uh, mental health. Um, you know, people being isolated, uh, people not being able to go to work, uh, not having anything to do, just staying home and watching sitcoms. Um, yes, I can see that that would definitely damage mental health, but um, I mean, we're we all work in technology. I work in security. Um, we have not been the people who get to stay home and watch TV. Uh, we you know, I don't have enough hours in the day. I, I imagine most of you don't have enough hours in the day. We are helping people uh, set up Zoom meetings. Um, we you know, we're helping our businesses. We're helping other businesses to do it. Um, we are helping our friends. Uh, to do Zoom or Teams or or Google Meet or you know whatever, um, and uh, so we've been helping. Well, helping others helps you. You know we're we're probably doing okay on the mental health front because we have been helping, and and this is one of the things that uh, the mental health people have been saying is you know when you are helping people, this this helps you maintain your equilibrium, maintain a, a good positive mental attitude, that sort of thing. And of course, uh, you know, the Bastion model is wrong because we are all in this together. Um, we, as uh, has frequently been said, we are uh, not all in the same boat, but we are all in the same storm. And uh, again, you know, we can't say, you know, we're in here, we're safe. Uh, we live in BC, so, um, you know, our, our numbers are not as bad as, as they are in places in the States, in California, wherever. Um, that is, it, you know, it, it, does, it doesn't work. Um, I, I can remember uh, one of the examples early on uh, when masks, were starting to be an issue and and masks were in short supply and N95 masks were, you know, uh, they were in demand and where were they being made? They were being made in the United States and was the United States going to uh, sell any N95 masks to us in Canada? Hmm, maybe they wouldn't. Thing is, the N95 masks are made for, from a particular type of fiber and uh, one of the sources, uh, one of the few sources, is the Harmac pulp mill on Vancouver Island. So, you know, fortunately, Saner heads prevailed and it was sort of, you know, smoothed over. Yes, you know, we're not going to uh, be America first in, in that regard. Um, but it would have been interesting to see how well 3M did when they couldn't get the fiber that they needed because they weren't being able to sell uh, N95 masks to Canada. So, you know, we are all in this together and uh, we ignore that at our peril. So, 
Um, I found a bug in Microsoft Teams when you guys asked me to use Teams for this series. Uh, it's been it's been an interesting learning experience, and I got to say there are things that I like about Teams uh, much more than than uh, some things you know in in Zoom. Uh, and and equally, there are things in in Zoom that it really bugs me that Teams does not do that. Um, but uh, I found a bug that the agenda when when you have created a uh, a meeting scheduled a meeting, um, then the agenda view disappears, and uh, the, the meetings that you have created um, aren't there anymore. And uh, this is this is one of the thing, reasons that I create the the new meeting, you know, like two three weeks in advance, um, so that I can announce it uh, on you know one meeting, say what the you know the next meeting is is going to be and what the link is and uh, that provision and back at the beginning of this, um, the. But the agenda view is is unreliable um, today. When I went on on this particular machine that I'm, uh, you're seeing me on, um, I actually did get a list of of the 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 agenda view the the meetings that I've scheduled over on the uh, this machine that uh, has the actual slides on it and it's generating that, um, and that's another thing I don't like about Teams, but we won't go into that. Uh, they. Uh, that version of of Teams won't show it to me. As a matter of fact, I, I created uh, the one for April 6th this morning. And, um, you know, within a few hours, it was not showing me that anymore. Gone. So Gloria said that this is proof that Teams was created by kids who never learned to plan and do everything on an ad hoc, ad hoc basis. I don't have any evidence to indicate that she is incorrect in this. So, fooey to you at Microsoft. Uh, it's a good thing that none of the, the Microsoft people uh, are are paying attention to <laughs> Vantag anymore. If it's Microsoft, it's, it's correct. It's us that are wrong. Ha, ah, yes, yes, of <laughs> course. Of course. Anyway, um, the uh, it's it's been interesting. Uh, ransomware, uh, of course, everybody has been talking about ransomware, mostly wrong. Um, it's it's interesting. Um, ransomware, uh, as I've said for years, um, the only, you only need one thing to address ransomware, and that's backup. Because ransomware technically is. Uh, they do something to your data. They they delete your data. They uh, encrypt your data. Usually, it's encrypt your data, uh, and and then hold it for ransom. You know, you won't be able to get at your data, use your computer unless you pay them the ransom. Uh, but recently, there's been another form of extortion going on, which I, I uh, have seen some people call breach extortion, and. That is where they will actually, you know, steal your data or, or they will copy your data. And then they will say, we will release your data to the world unless you pay us a ransom. Now, that's that's not ransomware because there's no where involved in it. There's no software involved in that other than the tools that they use to break in. Um, so, you know, that's. Uh, uh, that's that's kind of a bugbear with me. I mean, you know, I, this is my field malware and, and that sort of thing. Um, but Whirlpool has been hit by ransomware, supposedly. And a new and more infectious and transmissible strain of the coronavirus has been discovered in the UK and in Brazil and in South Africa. And I believe that it's at least two different strains in the United States that are, are actually different in variants and, and maybe uh, more transmissible. Um, haven't seen as much out of the United States, but anyway. And in both cases, my response is, so what? We know how to fix this. We know how to fix ransomware. We know how to fix ransomware. All you need to do is make a backup. We know how to fix the new virus strains. 
you know, the same five heroic acts that, you know, stay home. Uh, when you go out, uh, keep your distance from people. Wear a mask when you go out. Wash your hands. Use hand sanitizer. All that. And all of these things, we know what to do. So, you know, there's new virus strains. Doesn't matter. We know how to fix this. We know how to deal with this. Do not, you know, if they are more transmissible, it just means you have to use the five heroic acts more rigorously. It doesn't mean there's anything new and magic and, and you know, any, you know, new cure that we need to come up with. No, all we need to do is what we've been doing, just more so. So, on uh, law investigation and ethics, uh, finally. So, uh, a little legal and, and privacy stuff here. Uh, yeah, it's it's interesting here, particularly when we get into the contact tracing and, and issues in regard there and, and the uh, vaccine passports and stuff. And good old Ben Franklin and they that can give up essential liberty to obtain a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. Uh, so, uh, you know, keep that in mind. Uh, contact, yeah, contact tracing is important. Uh, privacy, well, I know that it's important to some of you. Not, it's not as important to me, but I know that it's important to a lot of people. So you, you have to think about your own balance. What, what are you willing to, to do? What are you willing to give up? Um, forensics, um, our study of forensics and, and uh, uh, some of the rules of evidence when, when you go into investigations, uh, and of course, my best advice for people who are going into uh, investigations in computer forensics is don't, you know, get specialists to do it and, and that sort of thing. But if you do investigate and and try and present it uh, as evidence in court, and I, I have a presentation on presenting evidence in court, and I think we're going to be doing that later. Uh, evidence has to be relevant. So again, at, with the testing that's going on in the pandemic, is that relevant? What is the relevance? Um, we talked about the metrics uh, last time, and you know what are the uh, what are the 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 relevance? What's the the relevance of these numbers? Numbers don't lie, but they can be used to mislead. Uh, so know what it is that you are actually testing. Know what it is that that test will actually tell you. So um, interesting in terms of, uh, of privacy, doctor's appointments via the phone. Um, and uh, we've been doing this, of course, with the, the doctor for the past year. Um, and we have uh, probably more uh, doctor's appointments than most people. Um, but recently they said uh, we, we had to sign this consent form. And this consent form on their, uh, on their website, uh, I, I filled it out for myself, I filled it out for my wife, and in the course of doing that, I made a mistake. Um, and there's no means of correction. And it's interesting in, in terms of uh, Canadian and, and European and most of the international uh, privacy laws, uh, that means that their system is in, in violation of the, uh, the privacy laws because the privacy laws state that the information you hold has to be accurate and there has to be a right of correction uh, to the subject. And, uh, you know, interesting now, uh, you know, again, this is this is something ha that has been thought up by somebody in the middle of a, a pandemic and, and therefore it's been done on an emergency basis. Um, in this case, I think they were a little bit too careless um, and obviously they gave it to somebody as I pursued this issue more. Um, I it was interesting that. Um, this had been requested, not necessarily by the government, uh, but by 
<coughs> the medical establishment probably simply in terms of protecting themselves from litigation and turned over to a private company and I, I think they, they just did not do enough due diligence and, and put enough thought into this, turned it over to, to somebody who, who just put up a simple uh, web form up there and, and uh, uh, did it on a very sloppy basis. So uh, <clears throat> interesting stuff. Uh, yeah, we've talked about the vaccine passport, the details, the version, the date. Was it multi-shot? Have they had a booster? Uh, do we have it on the data on the card on a central database? What about the jurisdiction? Are different countries going to accept that? Um, details of, of testing again. Uh, uh, have you been tested? Uh, you know, we, people have to be tested uh, three days before getting on a plane to arrive in Canada and that sort of thing. What type of testing uh, and, and when was the date and, and those types of issues? So. One of the things <clears throat> that has really, really disappointed me, I mean, it's the pandemic definitely has demonstrated the inequities in our society. Um, and uh, that's been very disappointing, but the, the racism that has been demonstrated in so many places, uh, it's come out in so many different ways. Um, and and that has been really disappointing, um, particularly to a Canadian, because a Canadian is a DP with seniority. And now I have to explain for those of you who are young that that is actually a racist joke. A DP stands for displaced person, and and specifically when it's the the abbreviated form DP, um, it was used for you know of course non-white people who were coming to Canada. So. You know, while that statement on the face of it is is saying, you know, it, it anybody, you know, a Canadian is anybody who's been here in Canada, and particularly, of course, the the people who have the greatest seniority are the First Nations. So, you know, our our, you know, and this is a Canadian joke because uh, Canadian jokes are very self-referential and and that sort of thing. But anyway, it's been a disappointment. Um, it's too bad, and it definitely, uh, you know, has not been kind. Uh, but by being calm, we can probably all stay safe. And that is about that. So, any questions? Anybody left who's still paying attention? Or yes. No, one of us is here. <laughs> hey, Rob. Yes. So, uh, yeah, the pandemic's probably exaggerated racism, but I'm just wondering if it was uh, exaggerated by uh, basically that former president empowering all those racists down there. So I, I think it, it's been a perfect storm of, of racism, I, I think, in the last year. It has been. It has been, unfortunately, yes. And um, that Ben Franklin quote... Yes. Um, what is the definition of essential liberty? Yeah, um, I think what he meant in, in that regard was was more like inherent. Um, it's it's sort of like, you know, why are you giving away something um, you can't lose for something you can never keep? Um, so I, okay. I think that was his in, intent in using the word essential there. All right. Interesting as usual, Rob. Thanks. Well, thank you. And I guess we will see. Uh, hopefully we will see all of you again on April the 6th for homomorphic encryption. Woohoo. OK. So and I guess I'm supposed to stop the recording.